Anderson. Uh, I work at Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Run the network there with uh, three other people. Um, and we started doing IPv6 uh, about 2008, maybe a little earlier than that, actually starting out. And around 2008, we got our web server up online. Our main www.wpi.edu is on IPv6. So. We're, we're not completely transitioned or, or anything by any means, but we have a good good start. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about a lot of the features of IPv6 and a lot of how it relates to IPv4 and what's different and, and how the protocol works differently. Um, and we'll get into some configuration and uh, mainly just on Linux systems. I didn't really put together slides for anything else for this meeting. but. Um, and then we can talk about some more advanced topics at the end if people have uh, specific questions or anything like that, I can try to answer them. So the first question I guess people ask is why do we need IPv6? It's probably pretty obvious at this point. Um, but this year, um, in February, the uh, International Assigned Numbers Authority actually had a ceremony to give out the last five blocks of addresses, IPv4 addresses, to the five regions of the world. And uh, they have none left to give out. Well, there's little scraps here and there of little bits and pieces of things, but for all intents and purposes, they're out. The uh, various regional registries, uh, American Registry of Internet Numbers, uh, the RIPE in Europe, and AP APNIC in Asia, and LACNIC in Latin America, and Acronich in Africa. They um, have various times that they predict that they're going to run out, but uh, no one can say for sure, but it's probably going to be within the next year or so. Um, one of the nice features of IPv6, besides the 128 bit address space, which gives us many, many more IP addresses than before ever had, is um, it has auto configuration built in, so you don't actually need a server. Like a DHP server, for example, is not required to uh, get an address on IPv6. In some cases, you may still want to do that, but you don't have to do that. Um, it, because there is uh, no shortage of addresses, there's no need for network address translation anymore with v6. Um, a lot of people have hoped that you would not see that appearing in IPv6, although it does exist out there. You can do it. If you really wanted to, you could do it, but there's no, there's no reason for sh uh, as far as shortage of addresses to do it. Um, another difference from v4 is routers can't fragment packets. So in v4, you can have a, a router in the middle of your path. Um, if it's too, if a packet's too big, it can fragment it into smaller pieces and send them along. That can't be done in v6. They decided that. Uh, for performance reasons and other reasons, they wanted to only allow end hosts to fragment packets. So, um, another thing is uh, v6. You have it's very common. In fact, every single interface pretty much is going to have more than one address. So with v4, you're used to having only one address. Yeah, you can have more than one, but it's very rare, or not too common. It's pretty much the norm to have mo more than one address on a v6. Okay. Um, how do you write down a V6 address? Well, given those 128 bits, it's a lot bigger, so there's a lot more to deal with than just the 32 bits. So they came up with uh, some ways to compress the notation. So the full notation has eight groups of four digits, and they use colons to separate each group of four digits, and they're hexadecimal digits. Um, that example there um, has a bunch of zeros in it. So what you can do is you can remove the leading zeros from each group of four. And you can also take one group of multiple zeros, and you can actually see if I can look at this here. So you can take the, you can simply <coughs> remove these zeros here. This, these zeros can all be removed. And then this group of zeros, the largest group of zeros can be replaced with a double colon. 
But you can only do that once, because if you try to do that more than once, it'd be ambiguous where the zeros would be put back into. So, um, And then I thought this was an interesting thing. I was recently looking up, how do you verify if, if the syntax of an IPv6 address as entered by a user, for example, is valid? And this regular expression in Perl is one such way to do that. Um, so given all the variations of different syntax, whether it's compressed or uncompressed, and some of the other things that I didn't mention here, um, this big, huge mess is how you can verify that it's a valid address. There's actually longer versions of this. This is one of the shorter ones. One of the really long ones is like half a page, and pe people kept figuring out how to make it better and better and shorter and shorter. So this is a pretty good one. Now, when you have that huge address, how do they split it up? They pretty much agreed to, from the bat, say that the first 64 bits is like the net network part and the last 64 bits is like the host ID part. Um, it's kind of like a fixed boundary, almost like way back when IPv4 started out, they had fixed sizes of networks, class A, B, and C, and stuff like that. Uh, so they kind of <coughs> kind of reintroduced that concept, but um, it's not really a hard boundary. You can really you can still change that boundary if you really needed to, or for various different things. But um, most hosts, pretty much every host, is going to have a 64-bit interface ID, and then the top part of it is the network prefix and the subnet ID. The uh, the other boundary is between the network prefix and the actual subnet, so you can have that boundary can move around and you can have um, any number of bits from 0 to 63, I guess, and the prefix, and then the rest of the bits up to six, bit 64 would be the, uh, the subnet. When you uh, use this, when you use this uh, fixed boundary of 64 bits by making that standard, they were allowed to basically take those lower 64 bits and do a lot of interesting things with them. One of the things they can do is this thing called Extended Unique Identifier EUI64 Address. So you can basically, this is what allows, part of what allows automatic addressing in IPv6. Um, and the way they do it is that you take a MAC address, at least on Ethernet, you take a MAC address, you take the first half of the MAC address and the last half of the MAC address, and you insert the FFFE in the middle, and um, you flip one of the bits in there, and out comes your V6 interface ID, your lower 64 bits. That's this example here. Now the reason you flip this bit is because um, every MAC address has a ha has this bit seven, which is uh, considered, which isn't is a bit bit that basically says, is this a globally unique MAC address as as you know, assigned by a manufacturer, or is it something locally assigned, which could be conflicting, it could be non-unique. Um, and they flip it so that the default for most MAC addresses is going to be it's a globally unique address. You know, most people don't make up their MAC addresses. So by, um, normally that universal bit would be one. And by flipping it to zero, it just makes an address easier, easier to um, use the shorthand notation with the double colons or whatever. Because if everyone had that bit set to one by default, because most people have universal MAC addresses, then it would it would make it harder to use the shorthand notation. So they figured they just invert the sense of that bit. Um, because the MAC address is embedded in there, you can be easily tracked as you move across the internet. You know, you plug into network A, and then you go to some other city and you plug into network B. Someone running a web server can see that, oh, this guy's lower 64 bits is always the same. And they can figure out that's the same person. Now, is this really a big problem? Well, not really, because everyone uses cookies now anyway. And you can be tracked in a million other ways. But they decided to make a way to get around that. So they can use privacy addressing, which just applies as a cryptographic hash to that EUI64 address. And uh, you perform duplicate address detection to make sure you're not duplicating someone else's address on that network. And by doing this, you can basically keep changing that lower 64 bits every once in a while. And anything that's currently using the old address will continue to use it, and it will become a de deprecated state. And new connections will, by default, use the new address. And eventually, you know, the old address will, will all the connections will close, and then it will stop using it completely. 
Uh, interesting thing is that Windows decided to turn this on by default. It's been kind of co controversial whether that it should be on by default or not because it makes network admi administrators like myself lives a little bit difficult to track hosts because we want to kind of track hosts sometimes. <coughs> as far as I know, no Linux distribution yet has turned that on by default or FreeBSD or anything like that. Um, just like in V4, there's different kinds of addresses. Well, there's also different kinds in V6. We have unicast, which just addresses one host, <coughs> multicast for a group of nodes, anycast for the single nearest node, and uh, broadcast. There's no broadcast in V6. So in V4, you can say send a packet and every single host in the whole network gets it. Of course, it's not the whole internet, it's just the local network. But uh, V6, you can't even do that. Uh, Everything that used to use broadcast in V4 has been implemented in V6 by using multicast. <coughs> um, there's also this concept of scope, which doesn't exist really in V4. Um, interface local, link local, site local, and unique local. Um, pretty obvious, interface local is just your, it's local to only that one port or interface on the, on the machine. The only common case I've known of that is really the loopback address, colon, colon, one. Um, link local is used extensively in, in all sorts of operations of IPv6. FP80, colon, colon, slash 10. One interesting uh, side note about this is uh, even though the whole thing of FP80, colon, colon, slash 10 is assigned to be link local, really only the, the FP80, <coughs> colon, zero, slash 64, that is really um, currently defined in the standard way to be used for like local addressing. I guess the rest of that <coughs> is just reserved for who knows what feature they might define for it. Um, site local used to be defined. They've removed that from the standards now. But the idea was there you could have another address that basically didn't leave your whole site. And the site can be defined by the administrator as being anything you want. I mean, the network administrator would just basically firewall that off from around the edges of that site so it could only go up, you know, would never leave the site. Um, they've replaced that idea with um, this thing called unique local unicast. The problem with the site local is because it was defined as a separate, like, separate scope, it had separate handling and hosts had to know about it and had to treat it separately. So there was all these other, all these rules around how you could send traffic and when you decided to send it site local versus global, and that was really confusing, especially for applications that didn't want to get into the business of knowing those details. So they replaced it with unique local, where you treat it, you treat it just like a global address, but <coughs> in effect, it's local. Uh, the other interesting thing about how it works is every site that wants to use a unique local address just picks one. You don't have to coordinate with the central authority, but it's and yet it's still supposed to be unique to you and not used anywhere else in the whole world. In the V4 world, you know, when you use a local address of 10 dot something or 192.168, that is going to be used by all sorts of other people. And if you have a merger or acquisition of a company, that can cause a problem because now you have company A and B that are merging. They both decided to use 192.168.1 dot something, right? So to avoid that problem, unique local does provide uniqueness so that it's very, very unlikely, statistically unlikely that you'll choose the same address to someone else. It's not impossible, especially if you don't apply the algorithm properly. Um, the algorithm basically says, you s one suggested algorithm was like to take the current timestamp of when you're doing this and pick a MAC address off of, of some system that you have. Since MAC addresses are generally unique and a timestamp you do it is going to be unique compared to when anyone else does it. That and apply a hashing algorithm to that and you're pretty guaranteed that it's not going to you know, collide with anyone else in the world if they do that same algorithm, if they do that properly. But uh, even so, some people out there, you know, they, they, they don't like the math. They don't think the statistics is good enough for them. So they, they really don't like the fact that this is, you know, wishy-washy and it's not really guaranteed to be unique. So they, some people have proposed having a central registry. In fact, there is a registry you can use when you create your unique local one. You can go register it just as an, uh, an advisory kind of thing to your space, I guess. 
And that, that's, that can be useful to have a unique local address in addition to any global address you have so that you have always have local connectivity within your site, even if like your ISP link goes down, for example. Uh, a couple more scopes, of course, we have global. Global is really defined as anything else, other, anything that I haven't mentioned in any of these other types of scopes. So currently we're only using 2000 colon colon slash three. That's the only one that's been uh, identified by the IETF for the IANA to be able to give out to anyone for you uh, getting your global address. That amounts to only one eighth of the whole remainder of the IPv6 address space. But theoretically, they can go beyond this. Say we screw this whole mess up and 50 years down the road, we run out of 2,000 clone slash three. Then we can start over with another one and we can do that eight times and still not, <laughs> well, once we get to the new one, I guess we have to worry about it. Um, you can also take an IPv4 address and stick it at the bottom of a v6 address. And this is used for various different compatibility layer protocols like uh, some tunneling things. Oh, most of those protocols, though, have been deprecated and they're not used anymore. So you generally wouldn't see these on the wire anymore, but they still appear in, uh, they can appear in log files on your system because the BSD sockets API does use this syntax, the former one, I believe, the one with the colon colon FFFF, to um, allow an application to basically be written to support IPv6 and v4 at the same time using one socket. Uh, so whenever a connection comes in that's a v4, it'll show up into the application as, as an embedded IP for the unique address. So is that a standard notation with hexadecimal and decimal in the same number? Yes. Yep. Okay. That's weird. So that, that is one of the things I didn't mention before, but that reg regular expression, that pro regex, will match that as a downline syntax. Mm -hmm. But only in the case of a v4 address at the lower 32 bits. So. <laughs> so that's one of those other kind of wrinkles that makes it hard to deal with the V6 addressing when you're inputting them. Um, let's see. Colon colon is an all zeros address. Everything I've read said this can be used for, uh, you know, maybe DHCP6 V6 is an example, but I've never actually seen it used in DHCP V6, so I don't know if it really does use it, because it uses link local addresses. Um, just like an ICMP4, we have ICMP, we have ICMP V6. You have your standard things that you're used to, ping, echo request or reply, error notification, all that kind of stuff. Um, just like people should know with V4 that you're not supposed to block all ICMP V4 because you'll break certain things. Um, it's even worse if you break, if you block it in V6, because if you block all ICMP thinking it's bad, then you're pretty much going to make V6 not work at all. It'll completely break it. Um, among other things, because of the next point, neighbor discovery. Neighbor discovery, which replaces the IPv4 ARP protocol, they decided to build it in to, as part of V6 instead of being a separate thing like it is with V4. Um, that uses ICMP. Uh, to do neighbor unreachability detection, duplicate address detection, router advertisements, et cetera, and of course, discovering neighbors. Uh, some other things it's used for, just like in V4, where ICMP is used for path MPU discovery, it's also used in V6 for that. Um, because they, because path MTU discovery was around when V6 was defined, they actually were able to build it in as right from the start as being a required part of the protocol. Um, it allows any host, when it wants to send to any other host, to determine the MTU of the whole path, the maximum size packet it can send that'll make it all the way from one end to the other. Because a router can't fragment in between, if you send a packet that's too big, but maybe it's not too big for your LAN, it's not too big for your ISP link, and it's not too big for the next hub, but somewhere in the middle, maybe there's a smaller link that can't handle a large packet. V6 wouldn't be able to fragment that in the middle, so it would have to basically drop it. Um, so PathMG discovery allows, through this kind of mechanism of sending packets that are progressively larger, I'm not sure if it starts at, at the largest size or then gets smaller or what, but eventually it'll find a size that doesn't make it back and it gets an, it should get an error message back 
and assuming that the administrator of the router didn't block ICMP, you'll get an error message back saying the packet's too big. And then uh, you know it's set a smaller packet. Other thing that's built in uh, um, to ICMP and v6 where it was separate in v4 is multicast listener discovery um, to manage multicast group membership. And uh, another point about v6 multicast is required to work. So if you block all multicasts or if there's some other reason why multicast is breaking in your network, it's going to break v6 horribly. Even, even unicast operation to send data over v6 is going to require like neighbor discovery and things like that to, to uh, use like local <coughs> multicast. Um, so neighbor discovery is, is like ARP. You send out a solicitation and someone on the link will hear that. You send it to basically the multicast address and all the all the nodes on the on that local subnet are going to listen for that and they'll listen to see if it, their IPv6 address is the one that's being asked for. If it is, they'll respond with a neighbor advertisement saying, hey, yeah, that's me. This is my MAC address. It'll be stored in a neighbor discovery cache, just like you have an ARP cache in V4. Um, another thing that's used in V6 where V4 doesn't really do this is router solicitation. So you can do the same thing to find routers. You can ask everyone on the LAN, who's my router? And the router will respond with a router advertisement. And the router also sends the router advertisements periodically. So if you don't solicit explicitly, you'll still get one every once in a while. Uh, and this contains, obviously, the address for the router <coughs> so that you know which <coughs> gateway is. Um, there's some other information in there that can be used. MTU, hop limit, things like that. Uh, hop limit, by the way, I didn't, I didn't uh, count it out specifically, but hop limit is what they call the replacement for the time to live field in the IPv4 packet. The router advertisement also contains some auto configuration information that allows a host to choose the upper part of its address, the, uh, the network part. And just recently, they added a way to send DNS servers over router advertisements because otherwise you have no way to find out what your name server is. One of the common problems with router advertisements and how it works is well, just like you can have a rogue DHB server in V4 on your network, if someone sets up an unauthorized router, sending out router advertisements, it's going to cause the same problem. It's going to basically make everyone think that they're a router on the LAN when they're not really authorized to be a router for that LAN. Windows Internet Connection Sharing, again, strike. And uh, this is the most common, at least in my experience, the most common cause of that problem. Someone checked a little share my internet connection box in their Windows box, <coughs> plug it into the LAN, and all of a sudden all, their v all your v6 traffic has been routed to them, them, whereupon it usually gets dropped on the floor because they don't have any other real v6 connectivity to route to. How does it work with the HTTP v6 and router advertisements? Does it conflict if both give the different router address or gateway? Uh, well, I'm getting to that. Okay. It, yeah, the short answer is no, but you're not going to like the reason why. Uh, some of the other flags in there, um, the M, O, and A flags. So the router advertisement has the M and the O flags in the main part of the packet. Um, and this basically is like a little hint. It indicates to hosts that are hearing these router advertisements whether or not there's a DHB v6 server that's going to be prepared to answer them. And if there is, whether the DHB v6 server is going to be used in a manner to hand them an address or just to hand them extra information. So this concept of having stateful DHB v6 and stateless DHB v6. When you're stateless, you're basically allowing the router advertisement to hand your, to uh, assign your address. And you're, the DHB server is only going to hand you extra information like the name servers or whatever else, other information you might want to hand. Um, also in the router advertisements, you have a list of prefixes. Um, and in the prefixes, the prefix is basically that top 64 bits that you're going to use to form your address or the network <coughs> prefix. And within each prefix, because you can have more than one on a network, you can have a network of multiple prefixes for different ISPs, for example. You can have three different ISPs, and each one can hand you a different 
uh, prefix, and you could have all three of those active on your host at once. Um, but each prefix has a flag called the autonomous address flag, which determines whether or not that prefix can be used to to automatically basically form an address. And we'll, and we'll talk about that too. You do want to turn off the A flag if you're going to be using stateful in the future. Well, you don't have to. You can have you can perfectly well have both. You can have a, a, a router advertisement assigned address and a DHCP address because you can have as many addresses as you want on, on your host. Um, so, with all these pieces now, we have three different main ways you can assign an address to a host. Obviously, the tried and true just type it in works as long as you don't fat finger your 128 bit address and you type it in. Um, you can use stateless auto address, address auto configuration. Um, the kind of disadvantage of that is there's not much else you can do with it other than hand your address and your router out and your prefix. You can kind of hack in the DNS server because they added a way to do that. It's not very widely implemented yet. Um, you can use DHBv6, of course, which has the full suite of features and functions that DHB as we know and love it has, with a few exceptions. Um, you can't hand out a default router or the prefix length which is also known as a subnet mask in D4. You can't hand those out via DHPv6 server. It doesn't, this, they didn't define a standard way to do that because the answer to that is, oh, if you want a default router and a prefix length, just use your router advertisement to do that. So today, if you want to run DHPv6, you also have to run router advertisement. You have no choice, you have to do both. Uh, and, and like I said before, if you don't want it, use the address as would be created using the router advertising, you turn off the A flag. Yes? What about uh, additional route information, not default route information? Like if you connect to a VPN, you need to connect to certain networks through that VPN. Right. Um, I don't believe that's in there yet. I, there's some work ongoing about that. There's some work ongoing in the IETF right now about handing out a default route via V6 because no one likes it. Well, I don't like this. I don't know. Some people think router advertising is great and we don't need DHPv6 and some people think DHPv6 is great we shouldn't need router advertising. So they're basically going to, eventually what's going to probably happen is you're going to be able to turn off router advertising you're going to get everything you want via DHP if you decide to set your network up that way. Um, but it's interesting, it's kind of it's like the Emacs versus BI can't, uh, religious arguments <laughs> all over again but <coughs> between those two protocols. The Interesting, other interesting thing is with DHCP v6, well with DHCP v4, you send in the packet when you're requesting an address in the server, you send your MAC address. So the, the MAC address is easily available to the server and over the years, a lot of places, especially enterprises, corporate education, things like that, will use that to reserve a specific address. So you can, you can basically have a static address but it's handed out via DHCP so you can administer it a lot easier. Uh, and that, that ability to basically know what MAC address some, uh, a request is coming from is not possible with DHBv6 directly. They replaced the hardware address or MAC address with uh, this thing called a DUID, uh, a DHCP unique identifier. And we'll get into the details of that a little later. But it, it does cause some heartburn because now you can't you can't easily assign a reserved address to a specific MAC address. So stateless address auto configuration. I've talked a, a lot about this, but uh, this is basically how it works. Uh, first, the host sends a router solicitation and listens for a router advertisement. Uses a prefix from the router advertisement to form the top part of the address. Uses EUI64 or privacy directing to pick the lower 64 bits. Combines the two parts get the whole address, perform duplicate address detection, make sure no one else has the same address on, the same, on that same LAN. And um, that same process is followed to, to create the link local address. You just use a static FE80 for your prefix and that's how you create the link local address. So it's pretty simple, it doesn't require, you, you're required to have a router. I guess when I said you don't need a server, you, you still need a router, I guess. But, uh, I guess if you don't have a router, then you can't get out of the LAN and you can still use link local because you don't need the router to do the, the last bullet point there. You can still do that without a router advertisement. If 
you want to use DHPv6 in a stateless mode, you can basically, stateless meaning that the DHPv6 server doesn't have to track leases of who, which address it gave to which host. Um, hosts use the stateless auto address configuration I just described to get their address. The DHPv server doesn't have to keep track of that, but it's still used to hand out DNS servers, NTP servers, proxy, et cetera, et cetera, whatever else you want. Um, Stateful is the traditional kind of DHP we're all familiar with where it does all that plus hands up an address and keeps track of the address in its lease database. A new feature is this thing called prefix delegation. So you can um, hand out entire subnets or prefixes. So for example, your ISP could say, okay, I'm going to give your house the slash 48 and then the router in your house could say, Okay, I got the slash 48 via DHCP prefix delegation. Uh, I could further sub-delegate that and say, okay, give a slash 56 to my garage. And then the router in the garage could say, give, give a slash you know, 60 to my car. And then my car could say, have a router in it that, that, to sub-delegate the slash you know, 62 or something to the engine control computer, and the other 62 for the occupants of the vehicle or something. Just an example. So you can have a chained hierarchy of prefix delegation and do that. <coughs> um, unlike V4, which uses port 67 and 68, they chose different UDP port numbers, 546 and 547. In my experience, the OS, at least the Linux OSs I've played with, uh, don't quite yet have it automated. You have to manually allow these through the firewall. <laughs> So it's kind of strange having to open up your firewall to even be able to get an address. That's how they did it. Um, link local multicasts, again, are used to uh, send traffic to the DHPv6 server. Um, you have two addresses there, one for all servers and one for all relay agents and servers. And different, you know, different parts of the protocol might talk to those different addresses at different times. In V4, we had discover offer request at. There's the four packets of the exchange, and they renamed them in V6, solicit advertised request confirmed, because, of course, it was they wanted to come up with new terms. Who knows why? Um, there's also this thing called rapid commit, which a host can use to quickly reacquire an address it had in the past, assuming it was still valid. So it's like an optimization. It's a two-packet exchange solicit reply. Back to this thing, DHCP unique identifier I talked about. Um, the idea behind this is they didn't want to use a client hardware address or MAC address to identify clients because they they said that you know people change hardware, they change out their Mac, you know their Ethernet card or, or motherboard or or whatever, and if you do that, then your address might change. So instead, they want they. <coughs> created the same problem effectively, but instead of when you replace hardware, your address changed. Now, when you reinstall your OS, the address changes. <laughs> so right now in current hardware, you know, of course, hardware doesn't have any way to store the, the UID, the DUID in hardware. So it's going to be basically on your hard disk, because your OS is going to create one and, and it installs. It's going to store it on the hard drive. Um, theoretically, it's not supposed to ever change after that. But we all know that you know, deployment models, if you re-image a machine or something, it's going to change. So there, there is some, uh, there is some current work in progress. In fact, oh yes, but doesn't that cause a lot of problems for like big shops that close to machines? And yes. <coughs> <laughs> well, they make it part of the post install script to insert them in there. You could, but then you kind of have to keep track of your all your unique IDs for every machine. And and then trying to map from a DUID to a MAC address or, or the other way around is one of the big problems that I have with it. Um, but there is some work ongoing currently. That, uh, in fact, I believe one of the drafts either made RFC status or is about to make RFC status that basically defines a, an existing thing that a lot of machines are starting to implement. New servers especially have this UUID, unique, uh, universal unique identifier, which is used for lots of different things. Um, and it's implemented and it's embedded in the BIOS of the computer. So they decided, oh, well, we have this unique identifier that has been implemented for various things. Why don't we use that and leverage that to be able to have a DUID that's at least something that may 
you know, for example, be printed on the box so when I get a new machine I can look at it. Just like I look at the MAC address written on the box today, I can look at this UUID on the box and have a chance of being able to tell what the identity of the machine will be when it's on the network. Um, you can also use a DUID with V4, and this is allows cross compatibility with V4 and V6 for things like dynamic DNS updates. If you have a, a stable identifier that's the same in both protocols, it makes it a lot easier to have to know it's the same client and it's allowed to update that DNS record, you know, to have both addresses on it. <coughs> Uh, the DUID can come in a few different formats they define, and it's extensible so they can define new formats, hence the one I just mentioned where they did define a new one. Um, the initial set was the link layer address plus time, based on the time of generation of the MAC address. So um, if you happen to have clients that are using LLT, you can kind of extract the MAC address out of it in the, in the server and find out what the MAC address is. But the DUID is supposed to be an opaque value. You're not really supposed to do that. Uh, you can. People do. But there's nothing that says that every client's going to have that. So one of the, any client that you encounter may have one of these other forms, like enterprise number um, or link layer address. Now, the LLT is supposed to be used when you have a place to store. So if you have non-volatile storage, you can store that in there. If you don't have non-volatile storage, then you can use just LL, which is just the link layer address. Um, but uh, it's, I guess they didn't want you to use that all the time <coughs> because it, there's more chance of uh, problems, I guess, if you change out the hardware. But they say here that they, if you, if you have a permanently connected network interface built into a machine, then you can use LL because you can't change out the hardware, really. I mean, you have to replace the whole machine. Yeah, so I did have a slide on this. Uh, the universally unique identifier um, embeds the, the existing existing defined definition of a UUID. Um, the nice thing about this is, and one of the problems with DUIDs in general, which this can, can solve, is you can know ahead of time, before you put a machine on the network, what the identity is going to be once it's on the network, so that you can pre-configure your PXC bootloader to hand out the right options to that machine so that you can do a lot of these deployment scenarios that we've known, uh, grown to love over the years uh, for automated OS image deployment and things like that. Okay, now we're finally getting to some of the Linux part of this. Uh, at least on Linux, they decided that instead of using IF config, they would not, they, they did actually define IPv6 ways to do things in I, on IF config <coughs> route and next step. But they're really pushing hard for people to use the IP command instead. It's much more featureful. It's much. It doesn't have any of the legacy corrupt, and the syntax is a lot cleaner. But if you want to, you can you can add addresses this way using IF config. You can add routes that way using a uh, route. Just adding the dash a kind of thing. Next step. Um, instead of ARP dash a, which only would work on IPv4. You have, uh, oh, I have it in the next slide. You have IPv6 NA, which shows a neighbor discovered cache. Um, the replacement for NetStep, I actually just learned this when I was putting these slides together. I didn't, I didn't ever even heard of this command SS, socket statistic. Uh, works for V4 and V6. Um, but for all your, um, your new syntax is down here with this IP command. You can do IP-6, you can do link, you can do things with links, addresses, neighbors, or routes, and you can show them, you can add them, you can delete them. I didn't go through every single possible combination here as an example. <coughs> it's pretty self-explanatory how it works. Although it's scary if you look at the help man page, the man page for it, because it, it gives the full BNF form of, uh, of every single possible command. It's kind of hard to read it. And the nice thing is, once you learn the UIP command, you don't have to care whether it's v4 or v6 anymore <coughs> because that same command will work with both in, this, in, the same, in a similar way. I'm a big Red Hat and Fedora guy, so this is what I know. I don't really know much about how the other ones, other distributions do it. But if you're familiar with this, 
config syntax. Uh, this is how you do the IDE6 socket SE sys config network configuration. Uh, in the main network file, you want to you want to always have this to be yes. If you set this to no, it'll basically tell it. It just be agnostic to v6. It basically says it won't touch anything. It'll pretend it doesn't even it isn't even there. And if you set this to no, it's not going to really turn off v6 because by default the Linux kernel is going to do the lick local and it's going to do the RAs and it's going to listen. And so if you set this to no, you might get an address via v6, one of those auto configuration mechanisms, and not even know it. You won't get a DHCP address, but you might get a one from a router advertisement. Um, if you want to specifically force any settings at all, you set you have to set this to yes, and then you can do things like turn auto comp off, tell us, tell the, the machine that this is not a router, don't create any automatic tunnels, things like that. Um, Could you use some underscores there? There's a, some of them have underscores, some don't. Yeah, I believe that's correct. <laughs> I could have made a typo on the forwarding one, but I think it doesn't have an underscore. Yeah, that's that's this is, you know, whoever designed the, uh, the Red Hat network scripts. Whatever. Um. Uh, well, I don't understand. Maybe I missed it. Maybe I somehow I didn't catch it. How, how are you going to get a firewall on this? If, every, if, if the whole internet is free to look at individual machines without a firewall, as we know it today? Um, well, the firewall. <coughs> It's not precluded in v6. You can do a firewall the same exact way as in v4. The thing you might be referring to is is, is when you have a network address translation router or firewall that basically translates the IP address to <coughs> private ones. That's the part that isn't required in v6 anymore, and that a lot of people are trying to get rid of because it breaks protocols horribly. But uh, that's just obscuring your address. That's not really the same thing as security. A lot of people would argue that you know a stateful firewall is is what provides the security. It just it happens to be that everyone's experience with a stateful firewall isn't through NAT with V4 because there weren't enough addresses to give everyone a public address for every machine in their home network. But they kind of want to restore that ability so that if you do want to, you can have that end-to-end -end connectivity from every single machine in your house to any other machine in the world. So you can type your address in statically, you can set the gateway. If you want to use DHCP, you set this thing here. Um, and you have to enable auto <coughs> auto conf, which is that staple address auto configuration. Because you need that to get the router, and you need that to get the prefix. You can only get the you can only get the address <coughs> from DHCP v6 right now. <coughs> How would you configure a computer that's going to roam around from one network to another? You just turn everything on and see what works? Well, that's what kind of what the M and the O bits are for. So by, by default, um, I didn't go into it here, but I can show you later. Um, network Manager GUI is, is, really, is really doing a lot of cool things with v6. And of course, this is how it was intended when, when they designed the protocols, and Windows does this and Mac does this. But, um, Basically, when you bring up an interface, you're supposed to listen for a router advertisement, look at the M and the O bits. If, if they're set, you're supposed to initiate a DHCP v6 request, etc. Mm -hmm. And then if they're not set, you can just do, you can just get an address via the router advertisement, which um, most people are using these days. Router advertisement has been around since the initial inception of the v6 protocol, pretty much. DHCP v6 was come, came a little later. So it's not widely supported by everything. Mac OS didn't even get a DHCP v6 client until the latest release, 10.7. Uh, before that, you couldn't do DHCP for v6 on, on a Mac. So because of that, a lot of networks are just going to be doing router advertisement, and they're not going to be doing anything else. And, and that case works very well in Linux. I mean, you don't even need to have your your network scripts don't even need to be configured at all. Like I said before, you could be completely agnostic about it. And not even set anything up in V6 and you just plug in your your Linux kernel is going to happily give you a, uh, a an address if it's if it's offered via the router. So um, well, barring any specific distribution that might might squat it down and turn it off by default, but the default setting is to, to do that. So uh, for troubleshooting, you have ping six and you have trace route six, um, 
an interesting issue arises if you're doing link local. When you have a link local address, you can have the same link local you can have the same link local address on multiple interfaces on your box. So you could have a situation where you have three different Ethernet cards and they all have the same link local address. So because of that, you have to give a scope ID which tells the application on your box which interface to use. Um, so there's different ways that different applications do that. <coughs> um, Ping can use the dash capital I interface option. Um, but luckily, most applications, a lot of them, support this semi-de facto standard. I think it came from the FreeBSD stack, the Kame stack, created this concept of using a percent sign in an interface. So you can do ping six, you know, FE80 address, colon, I mean, a percent E0, <coughs> and that'll tell it to ping through that, <coughs> that interface. Uh, trace route, I guess you wouldn't need to do that because you can't really trace a route on a link local because a link local doesn't cross routes. Uh, another interesting thing when I was testing these, these things, I found some interesting application compatibility issues. Uh, if you want to type a literal address into like a web browser or something, you have to, the standard is to put it in brackets. If you didn't put it in brackets, the con it would be ambiguous where the port number started because you can often type uh, you know, a web address colon some other port number other than 80 to connect to that on a different port. So they had to use brackets to make that non-ambiguous. Um, and in fact, you can also do the percent sign in some applications. E-Links works with the literal, Firefox works with the percent sign for link local uh, web, web server connections, but uh, Chrome, it doesn't work in. Uh, a lot of software just doesn't grok, the applications don't grok that percent syntax. So using link locals to do testing or troubleshooting or you know testing or, or, or test setups is not really a good idea because the scope ID kind of gums up the works for a lot of things. So DNS. Now a lot of people make the assumption that <coughs> if you're using D DNS on V6 that you only get a DNS out of, out of an IPv6 address back. Or if you're using DNS on a v4 host, you only ever get an IPv4 address back. But that's not true. There are two separate things. You can you can send your requests and get your replies, and your server can listen on v6 or v4. And that's completely separate from whether or not the data you get back has v6 addresses in it or not. So the resource records themselves uh, for v6 are called a quad A record. Um, which is your IPv6 address, and then the pointer record. The pointer record is the same as IPv4. It's, it's just pointer. It's not. They didn't create a new name for it. Um, but that is how you can map a, an address back to a name. Um, so because of this, you can actually query a quad A record over an IPv4 uh, connection. I mean, today, in, you know, if you have v4, you can still look up to see if a, a site has a v6 address. And if you're on v6, you can look up a v4. Address too. Um, <coughs> you can set v6 name servers in your sdresolve.com <coughs> to send your queries over v6. Um, if you want to configure a resource record in your DNS server, like bind, you would do something <coughs> like that. You, it's similar syntax, you just use a quad A type instead of a A. And this is your reverse zone. So the reverse zone, instead of using inadder.arpa, uses ip6.arpa. <coughs> and you basically do the same thing as you do on v4, except instead of the dot of decimal reverse, instead of reverting the decimal numbers, reversing them, you reverse the hexadecimal digits that make up the v6 address. You cannot do any compression here. So every zero that was in the original format of the 128 bit address has to be spelled out. So you have these really long, unwieldy addresses that are you know, like that. But because they did this, it makes it really easy to delegate your reverse DNS on any octet boundary or any uh, any uh, boundary. Now, what do you do if you look up a name and you have V6 and V4 connection on your machine? 
and you get back from the DNS both a V4 address and a V6 address record. How do you select which one to use? <coughs> this, this problem is called address selection. You can have source address selection, you can have destination address selection. <coughs> so they define this whole standard way to, to, to do this, and in order to do this, they created this new API called get adder info that all applications are theoretically supposed to be using now instead of the old get host by name. Uh, get adder info allows a full list of addresses to be returned instead of just a single answer. And they can be sent back by the uh, implement, depending on the implementation on the, uh, on the host OS in a, in a specific order. And that ordering is defined by rules that they go into detail on how they define those rules in this RFC 34. They have this policy table where they can do a longest matching prefix lookup on the on the addresses you got back um, from the DNS query, for example. And you compare the address types and scopes. So for example, if you want to connect to a link local, and I don't know why you'd have a link local address with DNS, it's probably a bad example. But maybe a unique local, a, a unique local address to your site. Maybe you got that back from your local DNS server and you also got a global address for that. Well, your machine might look at what addresses do I have on my interfaces that are configured. If I have a unique local one that has the same longest match prefix as the one I got back from DNS, maybe I should use that one first. But that whole decision making process is defined by these rules on this table. Um, basically, the upshot of this is by default, OSs are generally configured these days to prefer native IPv6 connections over IPv4 if they're both records that are available in DNS when look something else. Um, the good thing is is that if you have a tunnel address, it's not it's supposed to not be preferring that anymore because tunnels are really not performing that well. So if you have an automatic address that was assigned to a, an IPv6 tunnel or something, newer OSs are not supposed to try to use those by default. If there's also a, a, a good V4 address to use to connect to a host, it should, it should prefer a native connection in all cases. Um, you can poke with the rules at, by creating an etsygai.com on Linux. Uh, glibc will look at that and use those rules. I haven't looked at the syntax of how that file works or anything really, so I can't go into the details of it. It's there. Um, I didn't really put together a slides on all these other topics here, but uh, if people are interested, I can say a little bit about d these different things. Um, there's a lot of different transition mechanisms. They, the nice thing about standards is there's a lot of them to choose from. <laughs> That's what they say. There's so many standards, who knows which one to choose. Uh, there's been a lot of attempts over the years to define ways, to, how are we going to solve this big problem? How are we going to get from everyone from V4 to V6? Way back in the early days of the internet, they had a transition. I don't know if people here might remember that. I wasn't around when this happened, but I read about it. Um, but when they transmit, when they transition the old ARPANET from NCP to uh, uh, to IP as we know it now, they had a flag day. They basically said, as of this date, everyone will switch over, and if you don't switch over that date, you won't be connected anymore. Well, when they when V6 came along and they decided they needed to define this V6 protocol thing, they said, well, we know that the world isn't going to really accept that in this day and age. There's too many hosts on the internet now. Back then, it was maybe a few thousand hosts, right? You didn't do that. So there's this, they created a lot of ways to basically have V4 and V6 coexist. So there's two main ways to do it. You can either tunnel your traffic over a V4 network to another V6 network, or you can translate <coughs> between V6 and V4. Um, and there's just been so much work in this area that <coughs> there was, there's even ones I didn't even mention on this list, but there's like 6 over 4, the 6 in 4, the 6 to 4. Don't ask me to define what the difference is between them because I forget. And a lot of it's historical corrupt, and I didn't want to focus on all the historical corrupt that pretty much fell by the wayside. The current ones that you may hear about, 624, ISOTAP, Teredo, 6RD. Luckily, even a lot of these are going away. People, people, it used to be that, you know, Six to four is it basically allows a machine to automatically create a tunnel, and it'll basically um, take its IPv4 address, 
and stick it in an, a well-known prefix of IPv6 address, and it uses that same kind of compatible format where the lowest 32 bits are the IPv4 uh, address, I believe. And I might be wrong on that. I might put it somewhere else in the packet. Um, and um, it sends, it can send an, um, its packet to a well-known relay router. This is Anycast address. Uh, I think it's 192.88.99.1 or something like that. And the idea was that basically anyone out on the internet can advertise a uh, route to this well-known Anycast address. And anyone that plugs in their Windows box, because Windows out of the box does this by default, will try to tunnel to that nearest node wherever it happens to be. And you know, you get things like, oh, well, you know, I'm here sitting in Cambridge and I plugged into my, my box and I have this automatic tunneling set up to 6 to 4. And I try to connect to, before they define the rules to say that native connectivity should be preferred, you might have had a v6 address that was tunneled and a v4 address that was native. Well, if you try to connect to a website that had a v6 address, you would try to use that tunnel. Well, what if the nearest relay router for that was in Taiwan or something? Well, guess what? Your traffic's going to be sent to Taiwan, de-encapsulated to native v6, and then sent back from Taiwan to Cambridge where the web server lives. And that's just stupid. So. That's the kind of the problem with a lot of these automated tunneling mechanisms. You can set up manual tunnels where you manually pre-configure a six to four tunnel to one of the tunnel brokers, and because you set it up, you know you know what you're doing theoretically, and you'll put up with whatever issue, you know what what route you're going through to get to your tunnel router. Um, Teredo was invented to basically allow these tunneling mechanisms to work from behind NAT boxes. So a lot of people at home. They realize that you know no one has a public address. You know everyone has these private addresses behind their translating routers, and six to four automatic tunneling and isotap tunneling don't work behind that. So they had to do this Teredo thing. Microsoft was a big push behind that, and um, it encapsulates your v6 packets inside of a UDP packet. So it sends the UDP packet and does a relaying thing. It does a rendezvous and it figures out you know what your public address is on your router. And um, one I did use recently was 6RD. 6RDs are for rapid deployment. Um, it's basically the idea of doing automated tunneling with 6 to 4, but in a way that's not so wishy-washy where any, anyone out there can send out a route to a relay router and your traffic can be directed to anywhere. Instead of doing that, 6RD uses, an ISP would set this up. So for example, Comcast just had a 6RD trial where they, I was participating and you basically run a s software on your router, which they provided uh, <coughs> software, um, to tunnel specifically for their net block. So they had a, a certain IPv6 prefix that they have for Comcast, and you would get an address out of that block for your house. And it would tunnel to their router, but it was very, very defined. It, would, it was automatic in the fact that you didn't have to set it up manually, but it was still controlled within their network. Some of the other things that are coming along, unfortunately, it's called carrier grade NAT and dual stack light. Um, one of the things some ISPs are choosing to do is they know that they're going to run out of V4 addresses really soon. So what do you do? Well, one option is give everyone a V6 address. The problem is not everyone out there has V6 enabled servers. So for a long time, there's going to be the coexistence period. and, the, and the, you're going to have to have <coughs> some kind of connection to a V4, between V4 and V6. Or you're going to have to have a V4 address. So they're going to start doing multi-layer NATs. So you have a NAT router right now, and typically people in their houses have a single public IP address. Well, it might be in the future that you're not going to have a, even a single public IP address. You're going to have a shared public IP address. Or your public IP address that's on your router is going to be shared with you know 100 other people. And they're all going to have that same address. And they're going to do this NAT in, in the ISP at their end, another layer of translation that's going to basically figure out when a request comes in, which of those customers is using that IP address for this particular connection. And they're going to do port sharing. You know, They're going to have certain ranges of ports maybe that are, that are defined for each customer. It's going to be really m ugly and messy. Uh, I predict that there's going to be, you know, 
people people are not going to stand for this. They're not going to like it at all. It's going to break gaming. It's going to break who knows what else. Uh, a lot of peer-to-peer -peer applications probably won't work right until they figure out a way to work around all these other layers of translation. So uh, it's there. Some ISPs are going to do that. Other ISPs might try some of the translation techniques. So over the years, there's been a lot of different ones of these defined. Uh, but basically, the idea here is it's kind of like doing that, but instead of translating a v4 address to another v4 address or a v6 address to another v6 address, you're translating between protocols. You can do NAT PT, NAT protocol translation, or NAT64. So you basically say when when a, the other piece about the NAT64 is. If a host is on v4 and it wants to connect to a v6 server, or vice versa, uh, it might look up in the DNS, you know, say it's a v4 machine and it looks up in the DNS and, it, and normally it would get it back a v6 address, a v6 only address. Say a server doesn't have v4 because there's no v4 left to give that server, so it only has an IPv6 address. Well, the DNS server can synthesize a v4 record to give back, which points to a translation box, then the host on the V4 legacy host will connect to the translation box, which will then translate it to a V6 packet and actually change the addresses and the format of the packet to make it look like a V6 packet and send it on. Um, and then you can do the same thing in reverse too. <coughs> There's been some tests of these and the people that are behind a lot of these um, translation mechanisms claim that they get really good results. But there's limits to this technology because you can only do so much with translation. I mean, yeah, maybe your basic TCP and your UDP is going to work, but what about some of these other protocols? What about multicast? What about this or that? And no matter what you do, the, any of these mechanisms are, are going to be hit or miss for something. You know, they're going to have some issues. Uh, the best, the best technique is to use uh, what's called dual stack, where you're basically giving every host a V4 address and every host a V6 address. Of course, you still need DS Lite or carrier grade net to do that because there's not a V4 address to give everyone an address. Maybe. Security, um, security, the security situation with V6 is similar to V4. Uh, one interesting aspect of it is IPsec <coughs> is built in; it's required as part of the implementation. So theoretically, if you implement V6, you're supposed to have an IPsec. <coughs> available to use there. Um, Are you going to go into how to set that up? Hmm? Are you going to go into how to set that up? No, I'm not going to go into, into the details of that. It's, it's similar to V4 if you're fam familiar with it. It's the same concepts. I, I didn't put anything together on that. Um, it's it's not really opportunistic. You still have to have defined endpoints and you set this set pre you have to in advance say, okay, well I'm gonna I'm gonna agree that when I send my traffic to this network it's gonna go over this encrypted tunnel. It's kinda like a VPN client situation um that you do today. So it's it's not like automatic by any stretch. One big problem with V four is that you can spoof ARPs on a local LAN. Well you can do the same thing with the AP discovery packets so they to, to find a way to secure that. Unfortunately, I don't think C, I don't think C secure neighbor discovery is getting very wide deployment because it requires <coughs> you to pre-configure every host with a certi certificate. So if you have to go to every host and pre-configure it with a certificate, then why are you going to use? What do you, you might as well assign an address while you're there because <laughs> it, 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 you can't have someone just coming into the into a, a building like I just did today and putting my laptop on the MIT network. If I have to somehow go talk to someone and get a certificate, so in a lot of scenarios, you're not going to see that be deployed. Maybe in some of the you know really high security DoD networks or something, where it's a closed environment where you can really control everything, you can do that. Or maybe they'll invent ways to send those secure certi the certificate securely over DHCP or something. Who knows? But then you still have to secure DHCP, so it's kind of like a chicken and egg problem. Um, to solve the problem with Rogue RAs, you can do what's called RA guards. So if your switcher router has this feature in it, mainly a switch, you'd want to have this feature in there. So you can basically say block unauthorized router advertisements on any port and only allow it on the ports that are supposed to have a router on them. Um, V4 has a lot of features in switches these days. 
for snooping DHCP packets. So you can do the same thing with DHCP and say, okay, if a machine plugs in and tries to hard code or manually type in an IP address, it's not allowed to talk. It can only talk if it's gotten a valid lease from a DHCP server. That's called DHCP snooping. So um, a lot of those features are coming up, up and coming, I should say, in, uh, in, in some switches to do the same kind of thing with these things. And then uh, firewalls, uh, just like you have your IP tables, firewall, and Linux, you can do the same thing with IP6 tables. Um, in Red Hat type distros, they have an SCSIS config IP tables file and an SCSIS config IP6 tables file. Syntax is very similar. Um, intrusion detection and prevention, bandwidth management, well, I don't really have much to say about those, but you can do the same kind of things with these things. <coughs> Routing. I don't know who you're here wants to go into routing protocols. But, uh, the uh, dynamic routing protocols for v4, they basically extended those for v6. If you're using a tunnel broker, do you need those? Um, BGP, you can do. A lot of, uh, there's one tunnel broker uh, that I use that supports BGP if you want to. I haven't set it up with them. But, uh, I'm using 6xs.net. But, uh, I don't know about mm -hmm. them, but I'm using tunnelbroker.net. Um, uh, um, at WPI, we we got this nice slash 32. Um, and uh, how do you divvy up all that space? I mean, that's like a slash 32. If you take 32 more bits of that, you're up to bit 64. And then you have 64 bits of host address. So theoretically, I have. I have an internet size worth of subnetting I could do. If you consider that the whole internet now is only 13 bits, so I'd be forced to do this. Year, so. Actually, you have 4 billion internets there. I have 4 billion subnets, and each subnet can have 2 to the 64 hosts in it, theoretically. But when people throw about those numbers, they're they're, they're not considering all the other features you get out of that, like the EUI 64. So you're not really using all 64 bits of the host address to assign that many addresses. You wouldn't really put two to the 64 machines in a single subnet because that would be ridiculous. It wouldn't work. Uh, so it's not really about having the space down at the low end there. It's more about being able to do some of these automated mechanisms and some of these statistical uh, uniqueness kind of things. Uh, and then future things <coughs> that who knows that we haven't figured out what we want to do yet. Um, but uh, I've put together a plan for our space. Um, generally speaking, uh, uh, each site would have a slash 48. That's kind of like the standard. When you when you get an address space from your ISP, um, a lot of ISPs are agreeing to do slash 56s instead of slash 48s because they figured out that if they give every one of their current customers a slash 48, they would need like even more space. It, it would ease it up a lot quickly, so a lot more quickly. So residential, they might give out slash 56s. They're definitely not supposed to be giving out one address. You're, when, you, when you get a connection from your IPv6 ISP, you're not supposed to be given just a slash 128. Or you're not even supposed to be just given a, a single subnet of slash 64. You're supposed to be given something more than that because there's plenty of space there to be given out. And using the old thinking of IPv4 in the v6 world, they might try to do it, but they really shouldn't be doing that because it's going to just hamper innovation. You know, they really should be giving you at least a slash 60, in my opinion, if not a slash 56, if not a slash 48. When you when you when I got my tunnelbroker.net tunnel, I got a slash 48. So I have a slash 48 at home that I'm using like two addresses. Mm. Um, but when we start getting all our appliances on the internet, and right? Stuff and that's the idea. I mean, I read something that that thing I was talking about, giving your car car address and giving every little thing in your house address. That I read that somewhere. I wish I had a link to that, but it was really funny because. It really went into, I believe it was someone, actually one of the guys on one of the lists I'm on posted that. Um, you really can, if all this technology, you know, all these, these are, the one thing that, that, that kind of behind it is the routers, the home routers. 
they, they're defining standards for how to make a home router that works with all these different things <coughs> and prefix delegation and all that. And uh, there's not really many of them out there now. You can buy a few now, but a lot of the ISPs that handle cable motors, for example, they're not V6 ready yet. Uh, but that's coming. I think anything DOCSIS 3.0 or newer has to be have, have V6 in there. Well, for a lot of them, you can always reflash them with some open source program. Yeah, but your grandma is not going to do that. <laughs> you for your grandma. Okay. Has anyone done any exploration of uh, any security issues from from the point of view of like uh, you know Black Hat hacker who's saying, okay, here's all these new features and all this cool stuff out there. What can I do with it to break it to make it do things I wasn't supposed to do? Yeah, I mean, a lot of that's been going on over the years. I mean, IPv6 been around for now like since 2005 or something. But we don't have 100 million people at home. Been longer than that. Yeah. Actually, 98 was the initial. 1998. Working on it then. Yeah. 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 I remember I announced in 1996 that it had just been added to the list for now. Yeah, so a lot of these things have come about. In fact, one of the things is the routing headers. I didn't go into that. I didn't really go into the packet format of the routing header. But uh, in V4, you have this thing called IP options. You could put in a header, and a lot of the, a lot of the problems uh, with security happened because the options were mishandled, or you bypass firewalls by adding in null options and things like that. Uh, you have the same concept to V6 called a called a next next header. You can have a, a chain of headers before you get to your final data payload. And one of these headers was defined called a routing header. And this header was m designed for basically routers to look at. And you could have a hop by hop routing header and you could have an end to end router header. So the, the hop by hop one said that every router hop along the way is supposed to inspect this header. Um, and one of the headers they defined, they, they recreated the same problem that happened in V4 with called source based routing. You could do a source route on V4 where you could say, Instead of allowing the, the, uh, each router to determine where the next hop is to get to my destination, I'm going to predetermine that at the source. I'm going to say, okay, first I want you to go here, then 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 I want you to go here. Well, the problem with that is if you have a malicious host, it can create a source route that does all sorts of bad things, like creates loops, intentional loops. It could it could bypass firewall, you know, do weird weird things and all sorts of things. Right, so UUCP? Yeah, like bank path routing. Yeah. So, they basically, they, they went ahead and did this in V6 and they defined this routing header that could do the same thing, source routes. So they had to get rid of that because of the same problem. And uh, there was some other attacks with the routing headers. They basically had to <coughs> deprecate them from the protocol and remove them from the standard because when they designed it in 96, they had forgotten everything they learned about in, in 92 or 90 or whatever. I guess, I guess you could say that Around 95, 96, when they were working on IPv6, you could say that there wasn't a lot of commercial deployment of the IP, the internet at that point, so maybe they didn't have some of the knowledge or experience of these attacks. Um, one of my problems with v figuring out v6, you touched on to some extent, um, it's been going on for 10 years or more in terms of development. There's plenty of standards to do lots of different things. And whenever I start to look at this, it's very difficult for me to tell which are the ones that are still actively being used, which are the ones you clearly don't want to use. When I have choices, what are the pros and cons of between right. them? Does anybody who doesn't have religion on these issues actually, is there somewhere I can go to get somebody who isn't biased? Um, I found a pretty good paper on uh, LinkedIn from 6 x I was talking about, uh, about a uh, project that was done in Europe. This paper was published in 2005, and it basically goes through everything. Everything's like changed since 2005. This <laughs> <laughs> that's the problem. <laughs> this this publication from the NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology. This is one of my favorite documents. Uh, this does go into a lot of things. It's it's a little bit outdated, but it's fairly recent. I forget the exact date on it is. Maybe I'll just see if I can go to it and see uh, what the date is on it. But it goes. It, it goes into very in-depth on a lot of these things for secure deployment with V6 and talks about different things. It doesn't really say you should or shouldn't do one thing or another, but it does tell you about all the different things you can do in enough, in enough depth that you could probably you know, make an informed decision about it. Why didn't it open? The problem is that there's no best practices because it's not quite the best practices yet. It's all these little test beds and projects and one-offs, and let's see if it works, and we'll have a world IPv6 test day, you know? Like, 
they're working towards the thing. <coughs> yeah. Ah, here global it is. implementation, right? And five or ten years down the road, all of a sudden, right? Oh, like, oh, yeah, that was the right solution. Right. But, yeah, it's just in the start. So, I'll try to bring this thing up here. It's, it's actually was December 2010, so it was pretty recent. Mm -hmm. December 2010. Um, it's, it's pretty long. Is it, uh, how many pages is it? 188 pages. <laughs> uh, shorter than the one I got from Europe. But I mean, this <laughs> just looking at the index of the uh, figures, they have a lot of things in here. Um, a lot of the stuff I got from my slides was actually, um, I, I made sure that I, I read this and used that because. Uh, put this back up again. Oh, it's going to be again. So I have, yeah, that was one reference. Um, some of these other references. I liked this one because it it, uh, it, it had a counter for when the end of the world was going to happen. I mean, when, when IPv4 was going to run. <coughs> it's now zero, so it's not so interesting anymore. But, uh, I haven't looked lately. They might actually have a uh, similar thing for each of the RIRs to see when they're going to run out. This is where I got the, the reg regular expression of Perl. And there's some cool testing things in there that you can use to test the different algorithms and the different <coughs> regular expressions and see how well they fare in with all the different test cases. UI64. I'll so I can post these slides. Too. You're going to put these on, Speaking on the video? That'd be nice if people want to see them. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah, just send them to me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, unique local addresses. So, Chuck, do you know who has? A really large IPv6 implementation right now. <coughs> in production. Um, whenever I in the circles I am in, whenever this comes up, I think of U Maine because the University of Maine, the guy there, he's like done everything. I mean, they, they're pretty much done. Well, I wouldn't say done, but I mean, they, they they're very far along. They're probably the most far along as far as any education network I know of in the New England area. Um, and then to be honest, I think. Where I think WPI is one of the second or third in line, at least among the, the group of people I talk with in, in the Boston area. So. Um, but as far as anything else, I, um, there's this French ISP that was using 6RD. They actually defined a lot of the 6RD standards and came up with it. Uh, Free.fr. Uh, they, they've been doing this 6RD thing for years now, as far as I know, to their residential customers. Who's got the best mailing list? The best mailing list? Oh, just Synog or some merit list or something? Uh, I mean, yeah. Where does it come up? You know, like, I'm not a network admin anymore. So. Yeah, I mean, Nanog is, is one, but you have to put up with everything else that's on that <laughs> list. Um, I don't know. I don't really know what a good mailing list is. To, I mean, it, I'm on all the IETF ones, too. So yeah. There's one that's really good for operational aspects of IPv6 called the V6 Ops Working Group. That's <laughs> one of the most relevant ones I've found for what I do, as opposed to the you know the protocol geeks who talk on the you know other lists. So isn't so interesting to operational folks. You know, implementation wise, it's been a while since I've seen some of the charts, but a lot of countries have it a lot more deployed because the U.S. has the lion's share of the entire internet subnets. So the rest of the world is not so lucky. So I know um, from one of the last reports, which is probably a year or two ago, I saw uh, like South Korea and uh, Japan have a very large IPv6 penetration because they just didn't have the IPv4 addresses because they were countries. And Germany was fairly far along, and I think Canada is a lot further along than the US. I believe we have in the United uh, in the Aran region. I believe we have like three slash eight blocks remaining because we got we had two and then we got the one last one that they gave out and they gave the last five out to everyone and uh, I believe Europe actually already ran out if I know I think about it was it Europe or Asia one of the ones already ran out te technically now the local registries still have some so it's not like they the flow has completely stopped like you know it stops upstream first and then it, and everything flows downstream and eventually there's none left downstream <coughs> either. But uh, yeah, I think they're already run out over there. I believe it was Asia, actually. 
I think Ask Me Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I went to the uh, the recent meeting and, and uh, there's interesting policy discussions about all the stuff with V4 because, you know, there's this transfer market they opened up so you can transfer V4 address from one to another and now they're talking about a lot of global transfers so like if someone in the United States wanted to transfer addresses to someone in China, they could do that. It's crazy. Uh, a couple of things. Hurricane Electric has a really cool, you know, test process and they call it a certification process on their website, which is a neat challenge. And they yep. help you figure out how to set it up and test your setup and all that. It's a good way to waste like a couple of weeks of your time. Um, and uh, Comcast has on their blog information about their native IPv6 deployment. Uh, I couldn't find it there on my phone which network, which localities they're doing first, but they say they are doing native Yeah, IPv6 there was like two or three. I th was it Chicago and Seattle and, and I don't remember exactly. I'm just it's something like that. It was a couple. It's also about like the address. It was nothing in the nothing on the East Coast as far as I could yeah. as I remember. So. But they did say they're supposed to go the entire country by the end of 2012. Okay. So. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, but we're all going to be dead then anyway. <laughs> oh, obviously. Another Don't thing. Speak I, yourself. Another um, interesting reference I found after I put these slides together. Is this book called Running IPv6? It's a little older. I think it's from 2006 or something like that. Let's see what it's from. Yeah, 2006. Is it the A Press book? That's um, actually pretty good. I've read a lot of it. Yeah, and yeah. this is excellent. I mean, this goes into a lot more detail than what I certainly went through here on how to get all your various systems, Linux, FreeBSD, Mac OS, Windows, to talk on v6, how to exactly configure all your tunnels and everything like that. Um, and even beyond that, DNS. And so I highly recommend this book. It's a little a little older. Uh, if I'm thinking of the correct book, I tried to get this one, and it's like out of print. It might be it's either out of print or it was harder to find in some of the places. Maybe I'm wrong about that. But uh, a friend of mine happened to have this one, and I saw that. And I said, Oh, can I borrow that? I have to try and get this book. Yeah, I'm in the process of uh, getting the uh, blue dot org servers on IPv6. And once, once we get that done, do um, you have any thoughts on uh, how we can uh, help uh, promote the rollout of IPv6? Any volunteer uh, efforts we might uh, pursue? The biggest thing you can do is announce your, or, you know, install your v6 address in your DNS entry so that www.blue.org goes to uh, a v6 address. Don't do one of these little, you know, oh, I'm going to just use www.ipv6. Yeah, don't do that because we're beyond that. We're we, earlier this summer, we had World IPv6 Day. It was June 6th, I think, where all the big content providers, Yahoo, Google, all the big huge ones, were supposed to basically make their main websites, no fancy business with a different DNS name or anything, just make their regular DNS name v6 enabled for that day, for that 24 hours. And guess what? Not a lot of stuff broke. I think Google's been doing tests on this, and it's like, uh, you know, point one. 0.02% of all the requests that Google gets broke or something like that when V6 was enabled on their main website. Can't put something on the server. Oh, okay. Good. It is there. Yep. That must have been a different one. Excuse me? It must have been a different one that was, <coughs> uh, that was not available. Yeah, because that came right up, mm -hmm. those colors. Is there, a, is there a Kindle version? <coughs> I didn't look. Of oh, running our DVD sites? At least through APRESS's website directly. Oh. That's all I have. Is there any other questions? Okay. Thank you.